Continuing coverage of Carly Gregg's murder trial. Finally, we're getting to the doctor. I'm not sure what kind of doctor he is. They're fixing to tell us. Now, they just swore him in, and I think they're going over some documents of stipulation um, to see what both sides are going to be okay with, with coming in that they're going to be talking about. Now, look, they were saying... The defense was the only two witnesses they had for the day were Shaq and and Dr. Andrew Clark here. And look, there's five hours left of of the day on this thing here. So I'm like, oh my God, this, this poor guy's gonna be on here all day, it looks like. Well anyway, um I'm ready to dive right in, guys. Um let's see what's gonna happen. Let's, let's, let's do this. Uh, Your Honor, the parties have agreed to introduce the medical records and school records of Carly Gregg that the doctor reviewed uh, in his mental health evaluation. And also the doctor's CVs. Your Honor, we've also agreed to admit a sketchbook and a journal. I'll bring them forward. So obviously the jury's not in here. But I thought this might be interesting. I don't know. I haven't seen this yet. So I don't know if it's... Uh, Carly's taking notes. I just thought this might be relevant because this is the big... Stipulate to the CV of the defendant. Yes, sir. Uh, of the defense witness. This is a big deal for the defense. This guy right here. Okay. CV of Dr. Andrew Clark. Stip the CV of Dr. Andrew Clark. What do we have next? Uh, we have a. Yeah, no, that's going to be included in the. Okay, that's okay. It should be all. Okay. It should be everything that had handwriting on it. Okay, perfect. Um, journal and sketchbook of Carly Gray. Well, journals and sketchbooks recovered from the scene. Does the state stipulate that these are the journals and the sketchbooks recovered from the scene? Yes, sir. Defense. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Be admitted without objection, any objection by the state. No, sir. Be admitted, D-11, by stipulation. Agreed to stipulate to the admissibility of the counseling records of Annette Bennett. Yes, sir. Yes. Be moved in D12, all purposes without objection. And for the record, those are the only ones that are not bait stamped because those were the only ones not uh, produced pursuant to a subpoena by us. Vital school records, which are the medical records and treatments and prescriptions during her detainment at the Rain County Detention Center. That's only the vital core records. We're not to discuss in front of the jury detainment. Any objection to these records? Yes, sir. State or defense records? Uh, defense. All right. Without objection, correct? State bait stamp numbers 805 through 822. Any objection to that by the state? Just the records. Why don't we just do just the front of that instead of all yeah, of the <coughs> correspondence? This is a really big deal for the, the defense. Because this guy, medical records, what medication she's taken. Bait stamp documents 811 through 822 are court records. Does everybody agree to that? Yes, sir. They're not and they're not admissible. 
Mark these. D14 ID only. Oh my god. <clears throat> this is so creepy. Excuse me. Add bait stamp document 810 to D11 for ID. So the actual records are 805 through 809, correct? Yes, sir. The state agree by stipulation to admit 805 through 809. Yes, sir. Defense. Yes, sir. Do you need a paper clip? Those will be marked D14 as a composite without objection. Wow. <clears throat> I don't know how long this is going to go on. So I should skip it. Motion should not be. Motions, transcripts. Should not be attached. Any objection to 360 through 520 by the state school records? No. By the defense. No. This will be marked D15 next in number without objection. School records. This guy is still sitting on the stand. They should have had this crap done before he got on. Good night. Any objection to state bait stamp document 775 through 796 by the state? No objection. By the defense? No objection. No. Admitted D16 all purposes. Records of UMMC. Originate records. Look at the grandparents smiling at her talking to her I don't know y'all let me know if this is a little odd and I, I would like to know is is this the mom's parents region 8 records well I mean yeah they could still love her but oh my god <coughs> Any objection to state bait stamp documents 527 through 558 by the state? No, sir. By the defense. No, sir. We will be marked D18. Wow. It's not that the, I. I don't think I'm a heartless person, but man. <laughs> what she did was the unthinkable. And one portion of that is going to be the unthinkable. Stamps, and then the subsequent portion is that precise? Yes. It's not going to be bait stamps. It's going to be the material that they emailed to each of us uh, last week. So we want to make sure that both of them are made. The objection to these records by the state? By the defense. No, Your Honor. Be admitted by way of stipulation D-19. All right, finally we're getting to it. All right, here he is. Now this, I think this is a huge deal for the the defense. I mean, it looks like it's the only guy they got for the day, and it's going to be a long day for this, this gentleman. But I've been curious about this. I don't know what kind of doctor he is, so here we go. Let's see what's going on. Good morning, Dr. Clark. Could you introduce yourself to the jury? Yes, my name is Andrew Clark, C-L-A-R-K. Okay. And Dr. Clark, uh, what's your current age? I'm 68 years old. Okay. And what is your current occupation? I'm a psychiatrist in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Okay. And what if any, um, what, who's your current employer? I'm currently self-employed. So I have a private practice of psychiatry. 
I spend about half my time doing treatment of both children and adolescents and adults, and about half my time doing forensic work. Okay, so the prosecution never put anybody on to rebut him unless they have, um, they get to call up people again after the defense closes. That's a possibility that they can call their expert on to de- dispute anything he, he says, you know. All right. And what, if any, uh, teaching experience do you have? So I was on the faculty at Harvard Medical, Medical School for about 20 years, from 1996 to around 2016, and I taught and supervised residents at Massachusetts General Hospital. And then I spent about five years at Boston Medical Center um, from 2017 to 2022, and I worked half-time then as the Director of Medical Student Education and Psychiatry, so teaching medical students. And what specifically did you teach at Harvard Medical School? So I, I, uh, I taught forensic psychiatry um, as my the primary thing that I taught. I taught forensic psychiatry to residents at Boston Medical Center, and I currently uh, teach forensic psychiatry uh, at uh, Boston Medical Center, um, but just about once a month. Okay. And where did you attend medical school? I went to the University of Michigan Medical School and graduated in 1986. When did you receive your medical license? In, I believe, uh, 1987. What, if any, board certifications do you have? So I have three board certifications. I'm certified in adult psychiatry, I'm certified in child and adolescent psychiatry, and I'm certified in forensic psychiatry. And what, if any, certification have you held in pediatrics? I trained in pediatrics at Boston City Hospital from 1987 to 1990, and I was board certified as a pediatrician, um, but I've let that lapse since I don't practice pediatrics. And what, if any, certification do you have in neurology? I have no certification in neurology. My psychiatry certification is through the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. Gotcha. But I'm just a psychiatrist. And when did you receive your board certification in psychiatry? Oh, you're testing me. I think think it would have been uh, in uh, 1995 that I was certified in psychiatry. Now, as you know, uh, lawyers go to law school and not med school because we're not very good at math. But is it fair to say that's roughly 29 years that you've been? I believe that's correct, yes. When did you receive your board certification in psychiatry? I think you just asked me. I'm sorry. When did you receive your board certification in forensic psychiatry? Oh, um, I th- so I, I, I think it would have been around 1996 or 1997. Okay. And when did you receive your board certification in child and adolescent psychiatry? I believe that would, would have been 1997. Okay. And what, if any, residencies have you done? So I've done maybe too many residencies. I was, I was a resident in pediatrics for three years. And then I did a three-year residency wiggling. in uh, psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. I did, and then I did a two-year residency in child and adolescent psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital and finished my training in 1996. Okay. And when did you see, receive your subspecialty certification in forensic psychiatry? I believe it was 1997 that I did. And then it lapsed for a few years. And then I was recertified maybe around eight years ago or so. What, if any, leadership positions have you held in the medical field? So when I was at Massachusetts General Hospital, I was the medical director of the Children and the Law program, which was a a program of individuals doing forensic psychiatry and psychology. Um, When I was at Boston Medical Center, I was, as I mentioned, the director of medical student education and psychiatry, and I was also the medical director of the outpatient psychiatry clinic there. Um, I also had a a job at a, a, a trauma clinic in Waltham, Massachusetts, where I was the medical director for, I think, four years. And what, if any, experience have you had with the juvenile court? So I've worked for several years at the Boston Juvenile Court Clinic and the Norfolk County Juvenile Court Clinic. I'm early early in my career, um, so probably three or four or five years altogether. And what was your position there? Y'all know that um, I heard something on the radio this morning. Talking about, uh, it's Christian Family Radio I was listening to, and Dr. Dobson had a guy on there that had wrote this book 
uh, raising uh, knights or some, something to that effect. I, I apologize if I don't get the title right. But you could go to their American Family Radio website, look up Dobson and what program he had on this morning, which today is Thursday, the, the 26th. <laughs> Uh, they usually have the stuff on there, but I think he wrote a book so called something like Raising the Knights or something. But what they were talking about is other countries, other uh, cultures around the world and how they view young people differently than the Western culture. Like, like they, they keep calling them adolescents from 13 to what, 18? You're considered an adult at 18. But in other cultures, uh, say they're 13, 14 years old, they're, they're sent out in the middle of the night uh, to see if they survive the night with lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. Or, you know, the, the, you know, I'm just paraphrasing the show, but what was interesting about it, and I only got to listen to a few minutes of it because I had to run some errands and get out of the car, but basically, I, I just thought, wow, does this, this kind of ties into what's happening in the United States is that we coddle our young people and we're, we, we don't treat them as adults, but yet other cultures do. So a young man, uh, say so, some of the countries on the continent of Africa, that that's what they do. They view their their young men as men once they re and puberty only lasts a short period of time in these other cultures, but we put an emphasis on I. I just found it interesting that how we 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 coddle them, but I did see a couple of comments which triggered my memory of that uh, and how it's going to apply to this is that, oh, she's 14. She, she knows right from wrong. Well, she does. But I think in our culture, either we, we I'm just going to use the term again, uh, we, we've coddled them too much. I'm thinking that. And that you see these grandparents, how they're looking at her, smiling at her, and her and her stepdad, and all of this stuff. That the 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 heinous and severity of what she has done, and not only that we've we give these kids ADHD stuff. We don't know. I don't know if they have studies of long term effects on. I know it stunts their their from gaining weight. These hyperactivity drugs they give kids because the parents are like, oh, the kid's just bouncing off the wall because it's probably just, he just needs to burn off energy or she needs to burn off energy because they're just a bundle of energy. Young people are. And all children learn at different rates. But I just thought it was interesting that they were talking about that. Uh, go look that up. Um and apply some of that knowledge to where we're dealing with young people killing killing other young people or killing kids in the school or killing their parents or killing one of their friends. And, and they know this. They, they know right from wrong. And they should be treated as adults. They... Something is is wrong. So you're telling me that these grandparents and this stepdad is going to really think that Carly Carly is going to be somewhat of a different person. We all change as we get older through through every five to ten years, of course. But the core root of her acting upon her anger towards her mother it results in murder. She should probably never step foot on the streets again. That's just my opinion. Here we go. I was a staff psychiatrist there, responsible for conducting the evaluations um, that were ordered by the court. And who did you conduct those evaluations on? Uh, typically on adolescents or younger children who were court involved in some way, either juvenile delinquency or, or um, care and protection cases. I mean, do these psychiatrists and doctors factor in? Probably Jordan Peterson does. I don't know. I'd be curious to see what his thoughts are on this. 
on how other cultures view their young people becoming men and women and what age do they start treating them with the respect treating them as an adult and holding them accountable that these are the these are what we expect from an adult they have guidance from other adults in in their tribe community what have you and do they factor all of this in in their diagnosis of a young person here in America or in the Western culture, period? I just thought it was fascinating. Anyway, here we go. And what, if any, positions have you held with regard to child and adolescent forensic consultations? I was. Early in my career, I was a member of the Child and Adolescent Forensic Consultation Team in Massachusetts and did a number of evaluations, mostly competency to stand trial and not guilty by reason of insanity cases um, um, for, the, for the state. Okay. I knew that was coming. What, if any, fellowship posses- uh, positions have you held? I did a fellowship in, in infant parent mental health uh, at one point about uh, 10 years ago now, and I'm not sure what else. How many times have you testified as an expert witness in child psychiatry? I'm going to guess 150. That's just a, it's a somewhat of a rough estimate, but I've been doing it for 28 years and probably have a couple of handfuls of cases each year. Okay. And how many times have you testified as a forensic expert in child and adolescent psychiatry? I'd say typically, I'm typically when I'm qualified as an expert, it's in either psychiatry or child and adolescent psychiatry, <coughs> and not typically in forensic psychiatry. Okay. What, if any, peer-reviewed papers have you published? I've published um, two papers in the last two years, one on um, juvenile solitary confinement and one on the question of the ethics of psychiatric diagnosis. I've also co-written uh, two chapters on uh, a juvenile post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, we would tender Dr. Clark as an expert in the field of child and adolescent psychiatry. Distinguished to our witness. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Good morning, Dr. Clark. How are you? Good morning, sir. I'm good, thank you. Good, good to see you again. And you and I spoke over Zoom last week, didn't we? Correct, yes. But you didn't realize, recognize me this morning. So now the state has to question him just to make sure he's qualified. Or is he even qualified? How many of these kids are literally insane? I'm sure there's a percentage of them that, are, that are, have schizophrenia or something. I don't think Carly has schizophrenia or some kind of mental... To cause her to go to this level of the unthinkable, y'all let me know in the chat what you think at this point in the trial. Is she insane? Or she was just in the moment, like most young people are, in the moment. She's in the moment, kills her mom. Because I had a beard last Yes, that's right. Um, All right. Um... Are you where? Where do you currently hold an active medical license? In what state? In the state of Massachusetts. Okay, um, you're not licensed in the state of Mississippi, correct? That is correct. All right. Have you ever uh, treated patients in the state of Mississippi prior to your involvement in this case? No, sir. Okay. Um, have you ever prescribed medicine to patients in the state of Mississippi uh, in your practice? No, sir. All right. Um, have you ever been accepted as an expert in any court in the state of Mississippi? No. All right. Is this your first time in, in Mississippi? I've been, I've passed through here before. Okay, because. okay. Um, I got you. And you just uh, told Ms. Todd that um, whenever you've typically been uh, accepted as an expert, it's not in the field of forensic psychiatry, correct? That's correct. And what, just by way of brief definition, what is forensic psychiatry? So forensic psychiatry is that part of psychiatry that interfaces with the justice system typically. Um, so and most often working as an expert for court-related cases, right? But I think it's just a fancy word for he's a psychiatrist and he knows things about behavior. So the defense couldn't find anybody in Mississippi to take this case or to be qualified? I don't know. I'm just asking questions here. This guy's from Michigan. What? 
Okay. Why? That's a good question. Why him? Why not somebody from the state? Here we go. You're, but you're typically not rendered as an expert in forensic psychiatry, correct? That is correct. Um, Your Honor, uh, we would just re-urge our prior motion um, as it relates to uh, Dr. Clark, um, but otherwise, no further, nothing further. Any further objection? No, sir. All right. The witness will be admitted as an expert in the field of child and adolescent psychiatry. Hang on just a moment. Rex, one moment. So, the prosecution just wanted now to get that it the across. Witness has been uh, qualified as an expert. I was informed that the uh, circuit clerk has your lunch here today. Uh, I don't want it's eleven forty-six. I don't want that to get cold. All right, uh, or hot. E e either way you order it. So, if y'all would, we'll go ahead and take the lunch break. It's a good time for us to take the lunch break. Just knock on the door and let the bailiff know when y'all are ready. Everyone, lunch please break. remain this time. Yes, sir. Somebody wrote, I think the grandparents are bringing her her outfits. What the hell? I wonder if the grandparents that are sitting in the room is the grandparents, the maternal, he said maternal parents. I wonder if, if they were talking about them or the, the, the dad who's in jail's parents. I don't know, just a quick mind. Which grandparents are we talking about? We need specification, people. It is important. Was it her mother? Ashley's parents he talked to and didn't put it in his final report or was it the real fa the biological father's parents you may proceed Thank you, Dr. Clark you've been tendered as an expert and did you base your expert opinion on any facts or data um, that you've been made that you've been made personally aware of. Yes, I base my expert opinion on my training, my experience, my knowledge of the literature, and on the information that I gathered uh, as a part of this evaluation. And did you also base your opinion on facts and data in this matter that you personally observed? Yes. Okay. And can you tell me what you personally observed that you based your opinion on? So what I personally observed was my four-hour interview with Carly, um, my 90-minute video interview with Mr. Heath Smiley. Uh, I then reviewed a large quantity of records, including some videos uh, um, and some still photographs. So I guess, I guess that's personally a personal observation. Okay. And... Oh, we're going to... Did he, did he view the, the video of her coming in the house with her mother and then getting the gun and creeping around and then killing her mother? <clears throat> yeah, what'd he think about that video? Yeah, let's go. I'm ready. I want to know. And were you able to come to, did you, were you able to after observing and reviewing the records and your interview with Carly, were you able to come to an opinion as to the ultimate fact in this matter? Yes. Big question. Well, and is that contained in your report? Yes. Okay. Uh, just, to, just to be clear, I guess I came to an opinion regarding the McNaughton issue in this matter. And that's contained in your report? It is. Okay. Uh, I will say um, my position is that the final decision as to whether or not Carly Gregg meets criteria for the McNaughton standard is a one that's best left, one that is most appropriately left to the finders of fact. It's not my job, not my business. And I feel I'd be usurping their responsibility. So I didn't 
answer that ultimate question, but I believe that I provided enough information to allow the finders of fact to, uh, uh, to, to, to use that information in their deliberations. Okay. And that is contained in your expert report? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, at this time we ask that Dr. Clark's expert report be admitted into evidence. Objection. Sign objection, Your Honor. I don't know what the McNaughton, Mc, McNaughton, McNaughton standard is. What, what is that? I want to know. What does that mean? Hmm. That was a loaded question. I, I, again, I, I want to know why he left stuff out from the grandparents. What is this McNaughton standard? Obviously, I want to know what that is. Does he, does this mean, that, does he think she was insane? Is he going to say that? She was, in, she was, has temporary insanity? And how do you... I, I don't know these guys. Stain, you may continue. Remember, he, she, he only Dr. Clark, interviewed her for four hours. Are the interviews you relied upon and the facts and data that you reviewed and observed what you ultimately relied upon to come to your conclusion? Yes. Along with my training, education, experience, and, and familiarity with the literature. Your Honor, at this time, we would ask that Dr. Clark's report be admitted into evidence. approach. Wow. So they're having a problem with uh, publishing his report to the jury? I thought they had already had the report and established that when they had those sidebars earlier before the jury came in. I, I don't know what's going on here. This is... Uh, this is crazy. There she is, looking at the grandparents. God, I wish I knew which grandparents those were. Because I don't know. Yeah, did, did he... Man, the process, I can't wait the prosecution gets up there. Did he review the video of her coming in and then killing her mother? And then all the crap she did after. Are they going to break it down and analyze... Uh, piece by piece, look how calculative she is. She's looking around the corner. She She's thinking about what she's doing. She goes and gets the gun. She pauses. She has the gun behind her back. She's aware of the camera. Just saying. Are they going to publish this or not? I want to know what his answer that, that you reviewed and relied on the same that any expert in your field would typically rely on when making this evaluation I'm not sure I can speak for any expert but I believe that the protocol procedure that I utilize is one that is standard um, in doing a forensic psychiatric evaluation that interviewing the party interviewing um, um, knowledgeable collaterals, reviewing the relevant records, and then coming to a conclusion, I think is typically how such reports are done. And would your interview with Carly and uh, her family member uh, that you stated be typically done by someone in your field who's trying to come to an opinion? Yes. Who would be rendered an expert of that opinion? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, we ask that Dr. Clark's report be admitted into evidence. Still on objection. Yes, sir. Y'all approach. Oh, my God. What? Why? Why do they keep objecting? Shoot. Let me say kick the jury out. <laughs> I I want to know why they keep objecting. What is the problem? Why would they object to that? He's saying it's just a standard thing. I don't know, guys. I'm not an expert. I'm just an observer. 
I mean, the jury's still sitting there. And they keep that's what the third sidebar because she keeps wanting to put it into evidence. The prosecution's like, nope, something's wrong. What is wrong? I don't know, man. Well, you know, maybe her grandparents sitting there and her her stepdad all supporting her is giving her some confidence. I don't know, guys. This is crazy. She's taking more notes. Is she insane now? Or was she just temporarily insane then? Now, remember earlier, they established that uh, the doctor said he couldn't, um, which they were working on getting different stuff in the evidence, that he couldn't definitively say the drugs made her do it. That is big. But they're going to let that evidence in. They're going to talk Dr. about Clark, it. Based on your evaluation and the records you reviewed, what were your overall impressions of Carly's personality and development? So my overall impressions were that Carly was a young teenage girl who loved school, was bright, I think enjoyed the fact that she was bright, loved reading books, loved thinking big thoughts, that she was a, a loyal and generous friend, that she may have been something of a follower rather than a leader, that she was generally energetic, she was involved in many activities, that she had a, a, a close, although somewhat complicated relationship with her mother, and a close affectionate relationship with her stepfather, and that she had a much more problematic relationship with her biological father. And what, if anything, were you able to gauge about Carly's, his, you know, having any behavioral issues or a history of behavioral issues? So it was my impression that Carly had, to a very large extent, always been well behaved, was a dutiful girl, sought to do well in school, sought to please her mother by doing well in school. Um, and then in the last perhaps year, um, developed some what I took to be relatively um, 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 common teenage behaviors, such as staying up past curfew on a burner phone to text with friends, for example. I think one, on one occasion she snuck out at night after curfew to go visit a friend. Um, and then, and then um, uh, in addition, in the last perhaps six weeks prior to the arrest, she began smoking marijuana. You know, I never heard of, uh, look, I grew up in the 70s, <laughs> 70s and 80s. Teenager through most of most of the eighties. That smoking pot led somebody to kill somebody. If anything, the the, the pot would have chilled her out to some extent. Yeah, they say marijuana can make you nervous or have anxiety, but most of the time, guys, y'all know it, it it's gonna make her lazy. It'd probably affect her classwork. And she's going to want to eat. It's going to give her the munchies. And she's going to want to pass out and sleep. All right. I just wanted to point that out. All right. She started smoking pot. Well, so? Anybody smoke pot? Damn. No. What, if any, past history of trauma did Carly have? So Carly had had a somewhat difficult childhood in a couple of different ways. One is that she had a younger sister who died of a medical illness when Carly was about four years of age. And the younger sister was around 18 months of age. And Carly reported to me that that was hard for her. She remembered it happening and it was, it was diff difficult for her. Secondly, her parents divorced when she was around four or five years of age. She reported to me that she remembered a lot of arguing 
and that she recalled having seen her mother having been um, um, bruised or injured by her father, that there was domestic violence, although she never witnessed it directly. She told me that um, her mother had informed her um, that the father had beaten her. And she told me that she recalled she and her mother leaving late at night um, uh, in, uh, as, as, as the parents separated. She told me that she, and it's my understanding as well from records, that Carly had court-ordered visitation with her father about every other week, but that that was difficult, that she found her father to be um, angry, unreliable. Um, uh, at times, he would just sit in a chair all day long and not speak to her, that at times he wouldn't help her get food or fluid. Uh, and there was one incident in particular when she was around six years of age when something the father had done frightened her and she ran and hid under the bed. And this was an incident that uh, um, um, continued to bother her. She also told me that her father was a dangerous and scary driver and it was hard, it was scary for her to, to drive with him. What, if anything, did you learn about Carly's educational history? So what I learned was that Carly was always a good student, um, that she worked hard, that she got good grades, that she scored quite high on standardized testing, and that she had skipped the fourth grade. Um, and she reported to me that she really enjoyed or appreciated having skipped because she thought she found the, I guess, the fifth grade that she went into more challenging academically, and she actually liked, liked the kids there. So my understanding is that she had always done very well academically. And what, if anything, did you learn or consider regarding any incidents at school with Carly? So I think there were maybe two or three incidents at school. One was in, when she was in the seventh grade, she brought a knife to school. And she told me that it was a Swiss Army knife and she brought it because another child had asked her to. And what she told me was that the other child had then told the principal about it. But at any rate, she was found out to have had the knife and she ended up having to go to a alternative school for that semester. Um, I reviewed records from a therapist that had met with Carly and her parents on, I think, at least two occasions around that time and about that incident. Uh, and the therapist indicated that she thought that this was, and her quote was, much ado about nothing. And the therapist implied in her records that she thought the school was being sort of overly reactive around it, but nevertheless, Carly went and spent a month, I'm sorry, spent a semester in an, uh, an alternate school. And based on your evaluation and the records you reviewed, what did Carly actually do when she got to that alternative school? Well, what I, what I understood was that Carly had um, taken some responsibility for helping to teach the class when she went there. Okay, so we got Carly I'm okay we're gonna get to the conclusion I guess I still haven't seen this but what he's saying so far and what they're getting out of him is that Carly had a dramatic event she's four years old her younger sister passes away her her mother and biological father separate her her biological father when she went to visit him, it, it was, uh, you know, he's he's crazy. He's a loon. I'm sure that she told her mother some of this stuff. Why didn't she? Re I don't know. I'm just thinking, why would you not report it and say, hey, can we get some a supervised visit just to see if what Carly's saying is true or have Carly speak to a social worker? I don't know. But guys, is all of this leading up to, I mean, a lot of kids have traumatic experiences and don't grow up and kill their parents. I, 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 this, I think they're just building it. They're building it. This is what the defense has to do. Okay, so they're they're checking off all these things from the time she was four. Now she had, she takes a knife because some kid asked her to, and that kid went and ratted her out. Damn, blame. So she brings and, and knowing that you during uh, post uh, 
Columbine stuff, schools have zero tolerance. And and I'm sure that that was all in the policies. I know my kid has a thing every year at the start of the year. You got to read a bunch of guidelines. And of course, all of that mess is in there. And then he is supposed to initial it too, knowing that you are not to bring a weapon to school. So they're, they're building a foundation of Carly being having a, trauma issues since she was four. All right, this is what I'm gathering so far. You said earlier that you found Carly to be more of a follower than a leader. Can you elaborate on that? I think that um, it was something that I had read from some of her friends. Uh, des describing her in that way. I understand, for example, that there was an incident at school when Carly and perhaps um, other kids, I, I don't know, but Carly at least had, had, had drunk some um, hand sanitizer, um, kind of on a dare. Um, so I, I, I took that to be an example of her not using terribly good judgment and kind of, kind of being a follower, follower in that regard. That's being a dumbass. Based on your evaluation. When did Carly first begin to develop mental health issues? Well, when Carly was young, ages let's say six to nine or Here so, we go. what she reported to me was that she felt kind of depressed. Um, I don't quite know, I, I don't, I'm reluctant to use kind of the psychiatric term of depression uh, and that for a child that young, but Carly reported that she was unhappy. She said that it was tough having to visit her father. The divorce was hard. The death of her little sister was hard. They were living in a small house um, and I think somewhat financially strained. This is before Heath Smiley came into their life. She said that was a difficult time. She also reported, well, actually, I think two or three things. One is I noted from the records that there were a few occasions when Carly was noted by her therapist to have had intrusive memories or bothersome memories of times with her father. Um, and she was reported on one occasion to have just been minding her own business and kind of idly and having these memories coming back and were, were bothersome for her. Or aren't most teenagers depressed? I remember being a teenager and yeah. And, and then it, uh, now that you're older and you look back on the whole teenage thing in your own life, you're like, damn, I was a dumbass. And yeah, I was depressed and I thought, oh, woe is me. <laughs> I mean, but, and I got super angry at my folks. I mean, I'm not saying I had trauma, traumatic incidents as, as, as Carly, but dad, blame. Y'all know y'all have all heard stories of other children who've had it way worse than that. Who didn't go off and kill their mother and try to kill their stepdad. It, just, just to say, well, she, she had some depression. Well, isn't that most teenagers? A lot of teenagers go through depression. Even adults go through ups and downs. You wake up one day, you're like, dang, what's wrong with me? You wake up another day, you feel like a million bucks. That's just life. But, okay. All right. Carly was depressed. Okay. She also reported that she began hearing voices um, relatively early in her life. What? In, 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 again, the age of six to nine, that she began hearing a voice. It was a male voice, unfamiliar to her, that would say things like, you're better than them. Things that were sort of elitist in a certain way. She reported that. Okay, this is the first I'm hearing of some uh, psychological crap like that, like schizophrenia. Wow. So she's saying she did this, but I, I need to see some evidence that she has some schizophrenia. Come on, let's go. That became a constant, not necessarily bothersome, but kind of a, a constant, constant, constant thing for her. She also reported um, that again early on that she began to have this experience of feeling distant from the world that the, as if she was in a dream things were sort of foggy uh, for, for her in that regard so that was that she said was kind of a regular frequent thing that happened to her again in this sort of ages six to nine period of time you just used the phrase intrusive thought can you explain to the jury what you mean when you say intrusive thoughts Yes, I'll try not to get into jargon too much. But, but intrusive thoughts is one symptom 
of, uh, uh, of post-traumatic stress. Uh, and I'm not diagnosing her with post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, but people that have experienced trauma that haunts them afterwards sometimes have the experience of, especially when they're not paying much attention or when their guard is down, the memories will come back uh, and in a bothersome way. All of a sudden, they'll just recall whatever it was and it'll be upsetting for them. So, and for some people, they can be really bothered by it. Can be, it can be very problematic for some folks. But it, so it's considered to be a post-traumatic symptom um, and that Carly seemed to have had in the aftermath of her difficult mm, experiences with her biological father. Based on your evaluation, was there a period of time in which Carly's mental health issues began to be more significant? Yes. Can you um, tell us about that? So beginning from around the age of nine um, or so, Carly reported was that she began to feel depressed, um, uh, that the auditory, the auditory hallucinations, meaning that she was hearing voices, that, that, that those continued, that these experiences of feeling like the world wasn't real uh, continued. And then somewhere between the ages of nine and 11, the depression continued and she then began to cut herself. Um, and as I understand it, she'd been cutting herself for about two years, so starting around the age of 12, uh, that she would, on a fairly regular basis, make superficial cuts on her thighs as a way to help manage her anxiety and distress. And Go ahead. I'd be happy to t talk about just cutting, yeah. right, which is a relatively common phenomena that teenagers engage, typically teenagers engage in, not so much in a way to try to hurt one, kill oneself or to injure oneself as a way to just to cope with feelings that are too much to handle. So it's kind of a maladaptive way of coping with feelings and often it's a reflection of some level of either depression or anxiety or just mental health struggles. And based on your evaluation, about when did Carly's parents learn that Carly had been engaging in cutting? So I think it really wasn't until December of 2023, so just last December that Carly's parents learned. As I understand it, she had been cutting fairly regularly for about two years before her parents found out. And were there any other behaviors that her parents learned around December of 2023? So the other behaviors that the parents learned about at that time was that Carly had um, um, been using a, I think an old iPad or an old iPod perhaps to text with friends and I think with a boyfriend, quote unquote boyfriend, um, um, after hours. Uh, she'd be doing this, of course, without her parents' knowledge or consent, and Carly's parents found, found out about it. What if any issues had Carly begun to experience with sleeping at this time? So Carly began to develop sleep difficulties from the summer of 2023, and she reported, uh, and, and Mr. Smiley confirmed to me as well, um, uh, that um, she had trouble falling asleep and that she would often wake up in the middle of the night. And she began to take melatonin um, um, to try to help with that. And I think by the fall of 2023 found that the single five milligram dose of melatonin that she took um, wasn't enough. And so she would sometimes take a second melatonin tablet to make, to make 10 milligrams. Do, you, do y'all think if, if it's true that she had Science of schizophrenia, which I have family members who have schizophrenia. I have two family members who have been diagnosed by doctors years ago. We're talking years ago, back way back in the eighties. And I was I was just a young teenager at the time, and I remember my mother telling me a few years later because we were talking about it. I had questions. And she said that there were signs of it and that it gets worse as they get older. Now, I'm not an expert, but that I remember my mother telling me that. And if they don't take their medicine, yeah, they're hearing voices and the voices tell them to do stuff. Okay. So just knowing that kind, you know, having experience in that area, um, Minimal experience, by the way, just questioning my mother about things. Um, if Carly has schizophrenia, and it was starting from the time she was six, schizophrenia doesn't go away. It supposedly 
according to my expert mother, which is no longer with us, but she, my mom was pretty smart. She read all the time. She wasn't a super educated woman, but she educated herself. She was, she was, man, she's one of the most smartest people I ever met, but she says it gets worse as they get older. So that, that's telling me that Carly, if, if all of this is true, She's experienced schizophrenia. She's experienced depression because schizophrenia can have all they they can experience all kinds of stuff. All right, they're going to be depressed. They're they're going to be hearing voices. They need medication. She's cutting herself. All of this stuff. This is going to be forever. She should never be out. And she's already acted upon killing somebody. Now I'm wondering if he's going to say, "Yeah, the voices told her to do it." I don't know. I'm just speculating how the testimony is going to go because I haven't seen this yet. But what's interesting is uh, that she's got signs of schizophrenia. And if this is true, they should find her guilty. She should be put in a, a mental hospital forever. Forever. Because if you let somebody out... And keep in mind, I just said I had a family member. If if they get out, by law, you you can't force them to take their medicine. They have rights. <laughs> yes, this is true. They have rights until they do something. And then the police can get them. Then they go through the court system. And then they're put back into a psychiatric place. And then, then they make them take their meds. It's a crazy system that we have. Dealing with mental illness because of the ACLU says that, that mental people have rights. You do not have to force them to take their meds. Trust me, I have a family member. I witnessed it. They could not force them to take their meds. The police told, said, oh, we can't pick them up. Yeah, they might be saying crazy stuff, but we can't pick them up unless they actually do something. I'm, I'm not kidding. Now, this was back in the 80s when all of this took place for, in my family. Good God. Is this why we have a problem of homeless people and psycho psychotic people on the streets and they just self-medicate with street drugs? Because we don't want to have loony bins anymore. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. But, just saying. Guys, if she has it, she needs to be put away because it's not going to go away. Schizophrenia just don't leave the brain. As far as I know, it's there forever. Is that harmful to take two melatonin tablets? You know, the dosing of melatonin is pretty broad. It's not uncommon for people to take 10 milligrams. Some people take 1 milligram. I'm not, I'm not sure there's much data to support it, but it's not particularly harmful to do. But I know that her mother was concerned about it, and her mother began to hold the melatonin and give Carly just a single pill each night. Oh, Lord, so that messed up her brain? What the hell does that have to do with anything? Just saying. Just in case there's anyone who doesn't know, what is melatonin? Melatonin is an over-the-counter sleep aid that is, um, uh, um, uh, that's widely used, thought to be helpful for sleep. Melatonin is a naturally occurring chemical um, that your body generates to try to, to try to put your body to sleep. And so, again, it's, it's widely used. It's generally considered to be safe and maybe somewhat effective. And is it fair that, to say that melatonin is classified as a vitamin? I don't think it's actually classified as a vitamin, um, but but uh, again, it's over the counter, um, and I think, as far as I understand it, no one is particularly concerned. Um, no regulatory agencies are particularly concerned about the fact that so many people take melatonin. Okay. And what happened beginning in January of 2024? So after Carly's parents found out that she was cutting herself and um, um, staying up late using this burner phone. I'll say in addition, the other thing that happened around that time was that Carly reported to them that she was feeling depressed and that she thought she needed help as well. So really those three things happened. And in response, Carly's mother sought out uh, both therapy and a medication evaluation. Carly's mother contacted the pediatrician. The pediatrician made a referral. Carly had an evaluation uh, initially at, at Precise Clinical uh, with a prescriber. Uh, and then shortly after that, 
first her first uh, session with a, a new therapist, Rebecca Kirk. What was the course of Carly's treatment between January of 2024 and March of 2024? So there were two parallel treatments going on. One was the psychotherapy, right? So Carly was seen every week by Rebecca Kirk. And Carly reported to me that she really liked Rebecca Kirk. She found her good to talk to, compassionate. She liked, she liked her. She had not liked her therapist when she was younger, but she liked Rebecca Kirk and felt that she could, she could be open with her. And so they met every week. In addition to that, Carly met with a prescriber early in January and was begun on antidepressant medication. So the prescriber at Precise Clinical diagnosed Carly with major depressive disorder, which is the psychiatric term for depression, as well as adjustment disorder, and started the medication Zoloft. What is an adjustment Zoloft. disorder? So adjustment disorder simply means that an individual, it, it's a I'll just bash it back up and say, it's a DSM-5 diagnosis. DSM-5 is sometimes called the Bible of psychiatry. All the official diagnoses are in DSM-5. And if you're gonna bill the insurance company for a visit, if you're a clinician, you need to have a DSM-5 diagnosis to bill. Um, and so adjustment disorder is a pretty broad category that really means someone is having a difficult time with something that's happened in their life. I tend to think of it as relatively relatively meaningless. Like if you're not quite sure what else to say, call it an adjustment disorder and that cover, covers a lot of ground. And what is, what is major depressive disorder? So major depressive disorder really is the psychiatric term for depression. And in this case, depression, not just feeling sad, but depression is a psychiatric illness. Um, and And, how is depression different than feeling sad? So, so we use the word depressed in, two, in a couple of different ways. You know, if you're feeling down, you might just say, well, I've been depressed today. But in the world of psychiatry, depression really is an illness, and it tends to affect not just your, mm, I guess, your emotional state, but it can affect your sleep, it can affect your energy, your ability to concentrate, sometimes your appetite. Um, um, your ability just to enjoy things. Um, people sometimes feel they could just, their body, whole body has slowed down. Uh, and then not uncommonly, people might uh, become suicidal when the depression uh, uh, gets, work, gets, gets bad enough. So it's really considered to be a psychiatric illness. And it's often the case that individuals who are diagnosed with major depressive disorder then are prescribed psychiatric medication and antidepressants in particular to try to treat it. You mentioned that Carly was first put on Zoloft. Do you recall the dosage that she started on? I do. Um, so, so Zoloft is also known as sertraline, which is the generic name. It's, a, it's an SSRI, ser specific serotonin reuptake inhibitor medication. It's an antidepressant. Uh, and she was in, and it's widely used in, in, in teenagers. Um, and she was given the dose of 25 milligrams initially. Okay. And how did that medication seem to affect Carly? It didn't seem to have much effect at all. I will say it's a low dose. It's a low dose. Um, um, and so, so in that first month or so, Carly took it and reported that it didn't really make much difference one way or the other. So what, was, so what if any course of treatment was changed at that point? So in, in February, Carly had a follow-up visit um, with the clinician from Precise Clinical and reported that the Zoloft wasn't doing very much at that dose. And so the clinician raised the dose from 25 to 50 milligrams. And I will say that's a perfectly standard dosing. It's a relatively low dose. The, 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 the sort of the standard dose for Zoloft is 50 to 200 milligrams. That's usually the range where people end up. Folks will often start at 25 milligrams just to kind of go slowly and be gentle, but it's not at all uncommon for, for an adolescent to end up at 50 milligrams fairly soon. And how did that dosage of Zoloft affect Carly? So Carly reported, both to me and to the clinician, that at the 50 milligram dose, she felt numb. She felt as if she wasn't able to really experience much pleasure or feel her emotions very much. She reported that it didn't really help that much with the depression, but it really left her kind of flat in a way that was, um, um, uh, that was unpleasant for her. Um, and I will say that's a, that's a very common reaction. I feel as if I, I see that quite frequently. Do you remember the term Carly used for how it made her feel? Zombied, Zombied was the term. And what, if any, medication was Carly changed to after Zoloft? So at the follow-up visit on March 12th with Precise Clinical, she reported feeling numb. And the clinician then 
uh, changed her medication um, to a one called Lexapro or escitalopram. It's another SSRI medication. And I will say that it's actually quite common for someone to do poorly on one SSRI and better on another. We don't have the ability to identify up front ahead of time who's going to respond to which medication. And there can be a lot of very individual variability. So somebody might, some one person might respond well to Prozac and badly to Zoloft, and the next person might respond well to Zoloft and badly to, badly to, to Prozac. And it's a fair amount of trial and error that's often involved. And so the clinician, at that point in time on March 12th, prescribed five milligrams of Lexapro, it's a relatively small dose, and instructed Carly to lower the Zoloft down to 25 milligrams for 10 days and then to stop it. In fact, Carly told me that she just stopped the Zoloft um, um, cold turkey, I guess, right? Cold turkey is not quite, not quite the right term because she didn't have withdrawal symptoms, but she stopped the Zoloft <clears throat> abruptly on March 12th because she didn't want to take it anymore. And maybe she didn't quite understand the, the instructions. So starting either on March 12th or maybe the next day, Carly was on only the five milligrams of Lexapro. And was there a point in time when a... Uh, when a so I think that's where they're going to... Uh maybe lead into that because he's saying he didn't she didn't fully understand you know st stop taking uh, the medicine guys i have a 14 year old and and if he was god forbid if he was having to take some medicine like that i would be controlling it i wouldn't just let him stop taking something cold turkey I, I, is there going to be more in-depth talking about was... I, I know they asked the dad. The dad didn't know what she was taking. Did he see her take it? And, and they were asking him questions like this. Probably he, he's at work. He's not listening to that. You know, whatever. He's a guy. The mom would be handling this. I want to know, was the mom monitoring when she took her medicine? And I could have swore I heard some back test testimony that she, she was. But how could she just stop taking it cold turkey? I mean, you want to see her put it in her mouth and take some water? Or did she get it from her mom and go flush it down the toilet? I don't know. Inquiring minds want to know. So, so far that she she was, uh, could have schizophrenia, possibly. She was hearing voices from the age six up. When did the voices stop? We haven't got to that point. He hasn't said that. I was wanting to know. Does she, did she still hear voices? Did a voice tell her to kill her mother? So then now she's depressed. She's she's becoming a teenager. She's been cutting herself since she was, what, 11 or 12? Because she was 14 when it happened. He said she had been cutting for like two years. I'm just, you know, thinking, okay, is this the time frame? She's having problems sleeping. They're giving her serotonin. And then, and then now they, they she just... Her mom's divvying it out to her. Her mom's like just giving her one. She's saying it's not doing anything. Uh, then they, they subscribe Zolop. It's 25 milligrams. It ain't doing nothing. They up it. Then they stop it. Then they put her on 5 milligrams of the Lexapro. Where she was supposed to slowly wing herself off of this other Zoloft stuff. And supposedly she didn't. She's saying she stopped it. So is this leading up to she had some kind of psychotic thing because of the medicine. Because she quit it called Turkey. That's where we're at. That is where we're at. That is what I'm grabbing. I don't know if I'm buying any of this. Where is the evidence of her cutting herself? Is there pictures? She would have scarring on her legs. I want to see pictures of that. Now, did she just cut herself once or twice? If you're saying she had been cutting herself for two years, there should be some scarring on her. I also had a family member who did this. And they, to this day, have scarring on their arm. Are they okay now? Yes. But they did this when they were a teenager. Anyway. 
much. So I want to see if there's some scoring. I don't know if I'm buying that. How much did she do? Or did she just tell him this? Um, still don't know what the Norton standard is. I'm assuming that's just a standard of psychological interviewing her. But how much can you get from a person for just talking to them for four hours? I don't know. Did they give her some kind of test and she would read the questions and answer. Remember how they did to um, I know everybody watched the Johnny Depp trial and those two psychiatrists going back and forth was action packed but they had her uh, they had her take some kind of test some kind of gold standard test and then seeing if she could be tricky on the test when she was taking it I was like okay now, did they have her take the test? I don't know. They haven't said. But anyway, that's where we're at. We're going to conclude part. This is day two. Part two. I'm sorry. Day three. <laughs> Let's get it straight. Just glance down at my notes. This is day three. Part two. And look how much time is left for this guy on the stand. This is... This is all of, I think the defense is just, this is this is the meat of their case that they're going to try to minimize Carly's sentence. Now either she's going to have to spend time in a psych ward or whatever, but guys, if she's, if she is schizophrenic, she should never, she should never be let out because they have to take their medicine. And guess what? They're not forced to because they have rights. Crazy people have rights that you can't force them to take their medicine. The same. Go, go Google it. Go Google it. All right. That concludes this. Looking forward to the rest of his testimony.